Okay, hi everyone. Good to see you all. Thank you for making time. We're a nice, cozy group. Um, and uh, I'll make sure to bring you in and um, have a nice sort of audience Q&A session as well towards the end. So we're going to do about 30, 35 minutes in the beginning um, and then do some audience Q&A. Uh, I'm Ravi Agrawal. I'm the editor-in-chief of Foreign Policy magazine uh, and also the host of FP Live, which is our weekly show and podcast. And we're all here for a session that's titled uh, The Global Swing State. India's role in the new world order. And I think without going any further, I just want to introduce my two terrific guests. They are amazing India experts. So Tanvi Madan is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and also the, the director of the India Project there. She's the author of the book, Fateful Triangle, how China shaped US-India relations during the Cold War. I feel like there's a part two to that as well, because it's, it's... Working it's, on it, or at least I'm suppo <laughs> supposed to be working on it. <laughs> Instead, I'm here with all of you. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, a lot of other people have poked you on this. Um, and Sadanand um he's a South Asia columnist for the Wall Street Journal uh, and is a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Let's have a warm uh, round of applause for them, please. So, um, just a few quick things about um, why we're here and why we're, we're discussing India. India's in the news this week for obvious reasons. Prime Minister Narendra Modi uh, was in Washington uh, last week for a state visit. He was in New York before that. Um, you may have noticed that uh, the White House rolled out the red carpet for him. Um, he uh, had several prominent lunches and dinners and meetings with CEOs. Uh, there were uh, several deals that emerged from the week's meetings, uh, perhaps the most significant of which was uh, General Electric making a deal with India to manufacture uh, jet engine uh, uh, components in India, um, which is a huge boost for India's defense sector. Um, but beyond the state visit, um, if you ignore that for a minute, there are other reasons why India is really important right now when it comes to geopolitics. Uh, it is, of course, the country with the most people on Earth. It recently surpassed China, if you believe the uh, UN projections. Um, but I think more relevantly, in the last year or so, when Russia invaded Ukraine, several things happened. Uh, at the United Nations, India was among uh, a small group of countries that chose to abstain. Uh, from condemning Russia. When Washington tried to push countries to join it on sanctioning Moscow, uh, New Delhi was uh, a very notable holdout. Uh, instead of uh, stopping purchases of Russian crude, it dramatically increased its purchases of Russian oil uh, by orders of magnitude. Um, and many other factors that make India incredibly important uh, in geopolitics today. So that's just a quick framing of why we're here now over to our panelists. So Dan, and I'm going to start with you. Um, given the title of the session, let's just quickly define what we mean by the global order um, and what we mean by swing states. Um, absolutely. Um, let me sort of give you what I think is a kind of very quick sketch of this, though obviously this, a lot of this would be familiar to many of you already. Um, by the global order, we basically mean that set of institutions norms and rules that were put into place after World War II. And broadly, you could just sort of break it up into five components. You've got the global financial order, uh, you have which you, where you have the US as the world's reserve currency, and you have the IMF as the major institution, and the World Bank pressing for development. You have the trade order, which started out as the GATT, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, and then evolved into the WTO, and you have the Doha round going on. You've got the Maritime Commons, which is the UN laws on the seas. A lot of you would be reading stuff about the South China Sea and so on. That is premised on the idea of freedom of navigation and territorial uh, sovereignty in, 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 of waters. Uh, then you have the non-proliferation order, where the heart of it is the NPT, and the idea is to stop the spread of, of nuclear weapons. And finally, you have the human rights component, which is anchored in the UN Declaration of Human Rights. So these five things together have sort of uh, come together as the global international order. It's been very beneficial for the United States since 1945 
but it's also been very beneficial for much of the world because we have uh, seen a period of great peace and prosperity. Since 1945, we've seen many countries pull many, many people out of poverty, and we've seen many countries establish and deepen democratic representative uh, institutions over that period of time. So that's the global order. That's the order that people talk about safeguarding. That's the border that people uh, feel is under threat right now. Swing states very quickly, you can sort of use a parallel with the US domestic politics, right? Uh, why is Georgia a swing state and California is not? Um, and swing states basically have a couple of characteristics in, in global politics. Um, the first is that they have to matter. And India matters, as Ravi pointed out, uh, because of its, sh its size, its heft, and so on. There are other countries also that are regarded as swing states. Indonesia yeah. is a swing state. Turkey is a swing state. Brazil is a swing state. Some people say, call Saudi Arabia a swing state. But they, all these countries would share these characteristics where they have to matter. They have to have a certain amount of size or heft or importance in some way. And then the other component is that they have to be swingy. <laughs> right? uh, the UK is not a swing state. It, Japan is not a swing state. It's an Im enormously important country, but we kind of know where Japan is going to stand. So what makes a swing state of these two components, and I would say off the swing states, um, and I say it's not just because of this panel, probably India is the most important swing state on the planet right now. So Tanvi, we know that India matters. India is Swingy, I like that word, <laughs> it's a good word. That's the technical term. <laughs> um, I guess the question then is why? Why is India swingy? So I, I, I'm gonna step back and let me just say thank you to, to the folks at the festival for the invitation, particularly to Eva Hartman uh, for, for bringing us all here uh, in a very smooth fashion and to all of you who came here not to listen to Ron Klein or uh, discuss AI. Um, so I appreciate spending this time. <laughs> Uh, and I'll come back to the AI point um, just shortly. But I, I'm sure at the Ron Klain discussion, they're also going, why does Ron Klain matter? <laughs> but he's not swinging. He's not swinging, exactly. He's made up his mind. Um, we don't know that. <laughs> so I think, um, I think it really depends on, you know, when you're thinking about swing state uh, and thinking about India as a swing state, what are you swinging between? I think India is a swing state if you're thinking about that first uh, uh, character, characterization that Sadanand mentioned, that it matters and the choices it makes can shape the balance of power in the Indo-Pacific, can shape the weight of where a particular global, uh, or global position is, perhaps even on, for example, Russia, Ukraine. It's why, for example, the Biden administration is spending so much time with a country like India, trying to shape its views so that India in turn can shape the views of what everybody's calling the global south now. We used to call uh, the third world what used to be called the developing world. The global south is a term that the global south chooses to use. Um, I think in that sense, India is a swing state. It wants to be an independent pole. It is not, it doesn't do alliances generally. There are, ex there's one exception. And so in that case, it is independent, as Sadanan said, and so it is, it is going to, the decisions it makes will matter and will matter to issues that matter to the United States. It is not a swing state if you're thinking about it as a pendulum where the US and China are on either ends and India is in the center and it will, it will swing, that it is equidistant between the two countries. And India is not a swing state between the US and China. It's not walking a middle path between the two. It is aligned with the US when it comes to, to the need to compete and balance China because the fundamental fact that what is different today than in the Cold War, uh, that India sees, as Prime Minister Modi himself has labored it, the US as an indispensable partner for India. China today is and has been for a while, but particularly since 2020, India sees China as its primary adversary alone and in conjunction with its other rival, Pakistan. So I want to spend some time on US-China and this idea of India swinging between them, even though you're dismissing the idea, but it, it sort of prevails as an idea. And, and uh, India's place as uh, a place of importance in this wider rivalry between the United States and China is an important question to explore. But before we do all of that, five minutes of history. Um, has India always been independent in its foreign policy? Um, of course, it went through a period of non-alignment. 
Uh, Sadhanand, just give us a rough lay of the land of how India sees its place in the world. Yeah, so India became an independent nation in 1947. And one of the sort of founding principles of the country, so in, in, in its, right in the early days after independence, was that it wanted its independence from Britain to translate into an independence of foreign policy. Uh, it did not want to belong to a camp because it felt that by entering either the US-led camp or the Soviet-led camp at the time, it would be constraining its options and that would kind of be limiting its, the idea of freedom or sovereignty. So this is something that goes back right, you know, um, right, right to the very beginning. Um, the word non-alignment is not you know, used so much any, anymore, but um, I think that there's a broad consensus in India, this is across the political spectrum, um, that India strives for what they call strategic autonomy. And strategic autonomy, I think Tanvi touched upon this, essentially you know, you know, it, it means that India will not enter into the kind of formal treaty alliances that the US is familiar with like it has with countries like Japan and with Australia and with the UK and so on. And a lot of this really is, you know, has, you know, has been, uh, it doesn't mean that India doesn't, I mean, India has clearly over the last 20 years drawn much closer to the United States uh, than it was earlier. A few things drove this, right? You know, until the, until the end of the Cold War, uh, particularly during the last decades of the Cold War, India was, though officially non-aligned, it, it clearly leaned towards the Soviet Union. Uh, but with the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, there were kind of two really big changes in India. Uh, the first was that it uh, stepped away from a planned economy, uh, which it had followed from 1947 and it had not worked out at all, which was known as the license permit Raj, where the government was really uh, running economic activity. So it embraced economic liberalism. Um, and the second major change that happened then was that it began to draw closer to the, to, to the United States because its main protector and the main sort of bulwark that it had relied upon during the Cold War, the Soviet Union, had imploded. So, Despite those two, what those two things have meant is that over the past three decades, but particularly over the past two decades, India has grown much closer towards the United, uh, to the United States than it was before. However, that core idea that India will be an independent pole, India will not simply belong to another camp, uh, has remained and has remained in place regardless of which party has been in power. So Tanvi, um, Sadanan's kind of laid out Indian foreign policy from 1947 to the early 2000s, I guess. Um, in the last 15, 20 years, and I think especially with Prime Minister Narendra Modi's uh, um, term in power from 2014 to now, um, how do you see India's place in the world evolving? Um, and the backdrop to this, of course, is the fact that India has uh, expanded its economy, um, it has more clout. Uh, it's clearly being courted by other countries um, for business and trade. So how does that affect its thinking about foreign policy? So it's interesting how amazingly sticky some aspects and elements of Indian foreign policy are across governments that on, on things like domestic ideo ideological issues might be very different in India. And what Sadhanan laid out, which is kind of this idea of uh, seeking strategic autonomy or basically it's what they uh, will, and, and this government now doesn't even use strategic autonomy, they'll use the term independence of action uh, and that desire for it, which is almost sort of as an end in itself, not just a means to an end. That remains sticky. So if you want to think about whether it's non-alignment, whether it's strategic autonomy, this, the search for strategic autonomy, what it is fundamentally, and this has remained kind of sticky. It's evolved in different ways, which I'll talk about, but it's a policy of diversification. It's essentially a diversification strategy, which is <clears throat> India has always wanted to maintain a diversified portfolio of partners. The idea being, they know they will be dependent and entangled with the rest of the world, but they want to minimize other countries, any single other country's ability to use that dependence and leverage to constrain them. And so what they've done is they've said, let's have options. Because you know we can't trust that tomorrow the US or the Soviet Union won't change its mind about us because of their own interests. So if you keep a diversified portfolio of partners, which even the Modi government has done, uh, you will have those options. 
Um, and what they've done essentially now, as they look at that portfolio, it's not weighted equally. That's changed, the weighting has changed over time. And what you've seen essentially over the last 20, 25 years is partly because of the reasons that Sadanand has laid out, accelerated under the Modi government, is if you want to economically and technologically transform uh, India, the partners that they see and where they have put more of their investments within that portfolio is with the West. Not just the US, Europe as well, Japan, South Korea, uh, mostly US allies, Israel, a uh, lot of uh, recent investment in the Middle East as well. And I mean investment in terms of not just uh, actual funds or economic ties, uh, but political capital and diplomatic capital as well. So what you've seen under the Modi government on the one hand is a continuation of this diversification strategy. Uh, he has been more open about the fact, and this has been a general trend in his foreign policy, it's true when he thinks about Israel and Palestine as well, he thinks about it on other issues, that if you're doing something, don't hide it. So in previous governments, they were leaning closer to the US, they didn't like to talk about it as much. He's willing to say the US is an indispensable partner. Um, you're also seeing that, as you outlined, Ravi, that as India's economy has grown, as its half capabilities have grown, that in turn has also given India a larger voice on the global stage. But it's interesting in some ways how you've seen the Modi government also go back to some another aspect, this kind of being what they call, the India says it's a voice of the global south. This is something Nehru used to say, India's first prime minister uh, in the 1950s. There was a big Afro-Asian summit in Bandung in Indonesia about you know, not taking uh, a side. And so that has come back. So I think you've fundamentally seen an evolution in uh, visibility, evolution in India's weight, uh, evolution in the fact that India's voice doesn't just matter in the Indo-Pacific or Asia, if you will, today, but on the global stage. Uh, and so that, but it is very clear that that very much is dependent on the capabilities India has. So you've seen an evolution that goes very much to this link uh, with India's capabilities. Mm. I'm, I'm imagining now India as a hedge fund that is, <laughs> that is growing in, in the scope and size of its portfolio and is attracted to blue chip sort of partners and clients. I will just add one thing which is important, and so then maybe can talk about kind of, the, kind of the, some of the cultural aspects. But both this government and the previous government, they don't see India as an emerging power. The previous government, you had the national security advisor saying, India is not an emerging power, it is a re-emerging -emer power. This goes back, and this is something China says as well, which is China and India 200 or 150 years ago, together accounted for half of the world's GDP. And so the, the idea that these, the Indi for India, it's an old civilization, it deserves that role is also very much inherent, both in the previous government, much more so now. Mm. So um, given the ramifications of what you're saying, of this re-emerging power that is on a trajectory to becoming bigger in size and scope, more, more heft and clout on the global stage, Sudanan, does do values matter here? Like, is it is it possible to define what India's values are? I think they do matter, um, and I think that's you know anyone who sort of follows the 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 press on India, uh, including my column in the Wall Street Journal, um, sort of nice plug there. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I'm here for. I mean, I plugged on uh, these books, so I think uh, that's fair. Yeah, and while you're at it, you can follow me on Twitter, too, at <laughs> Dhu Mein, D -H -U -M. Um, it, it, it matters enormously, and, and you know, it's sort of, on, on, a, on a more serious note, it's, it's part of a larger, you know, uh, conversation we're having around the world about liberalism. And to what degree are, you know, when we think of democracy, and when we speak of democracy, you had a session yesterday on democracy, you know, most of us mean liberal democracy. But the liberal part of liberal democracy, right, which is um, equality before the law, due process, freedom of speech and freedom of inquiry as methods of approaching the truth, uh, the idea of a free media, um, these are all things that established liberal democracies have long taken for granted. Um, and I would argue that in much of the world, and certainly including in India, these are questions that are up for debate.
And so what is happening is that even as India grows more powerful economically and more powerful uh, militarily, what we're also seeing is that an erosion of the liberal aspects of liberal democracy in India. Uh, when you speak to an Indian about this very often, I, I write about this a lot and I get a lot of pushback because every time I say that, well, you know, there's, a, you know, there's democratic backsliding in India, I get a sort of barrage of people on Twitter saying that, what are you smoking? We had more than 600 million voters. Well, can we I just add some color to this? On Sadanan's last column, uh, someone screenshotted a, a portion of it and then said, oh, well, what do you expect from the Soros-owned Wall Street Journal? Uh, yeah. so they completely got it wrong. And the person who tweeted this was a, a former Indian foreign secretary. So yes. uh, the, the, uh, the anger at, I think, Western-based commentators is very real. And it comes with some serious trolling and uh, the barrage of criticism and, and brickbats is real. So anyway, continue. Yeah, so, you know, and, and I, I kind of understand where they're coming from, right? Because if you view democracy simply as the ability to, you know, on election day to walk into a polling booth and press a button, and that ends up determining who end, ends up being your chief minister or your member of parliament or ultimately your prime, prime minister, um, I think Indian democracy by that parameter is in fact in pretty good health. But if you instead look at democracy as liberal democracy, and you look at the ability of uh, journalists to speak freely, or commentators to speak freely without facing a sort of very ugly kind of, uh, well, I mean, the trolling is the least of it. There are people who end up in prison for years, right? Particularly in places like, like, like Kashmir. Uh, if, you, if you look at some of the treatment of religious minorities, in particular Muslims and Christians, um, these are uh, issues that really cut to the heart of uh, this debate that we're having across the world about liberalism and uh, you know, what, what liberalism allows, uh, allows people, particularly minorities, in terms of protections. And so that's kind of, you know, if I had to sum up, that's the double-edged sword, right? You have India that is rising dramatically in these ways, at the same time consolidating its democracy in, in electoral terms, but in liberal terms, its democracy seems to be going in a direction that if you care about the liberal international order, ought to be some cause for cause concern. Mm. So Tandi, um, I think most scholars of democracy would agree with Sadan in that India has seen a real slippage um, in the various elements and factors that go into determining and rating and ranking uh, democracy. Um, and you can cite Freedom House's rankings or Freedom of the Press rankings, but, but there's enough evidence there that there's been some slippage uh, uh, on how free and fair India is, especially in the last decade or so. Given that, um, I want to ask you about how other countries engage with India on that. It seems to me that 10, 15, 20 years ago, the West was much freer and more willing to criticize India where it needed to. It seems to me that in the last week, for example, um, when uh, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan was speaking to reporters, he was asked about democracy and freedom of the press in India, and he said, well, when we bring up these things, we bring them up in private. Um, and we saw that uh, happen across the course of the week when Modi was in the United States. Um, and maybe President Biden did bring it up in private, but there's a clear shift where it seems like the West is, is a little bit more reluctant to criticize India in public perhaps because of India's clout, perhaps because they need India. Um, what's your sense of how that shift looks and where it's headed? I think there are a few different reasons, some of which kind of you outline. I think for one, there is a sense that, I don't think they just, because what uh, National Security Advisor Sullivan also said, it is not for me to decide India's domestic politics, it is for Indians to decide. And so it is, in some ways, they do actually think that you know, in an authoritarian regime where voters aren't getting to vote, uh, you, can, you, know, you actually say this is not representative, et cetera, that there is, to some extent, if those, you know, a, a good chunk, not all, obviously, a good chunk of uh, uh, Indian voters decide this is the prime minister they want, these are the policies they want, it, there's only that much that the US can say or should say. 
There is this aspect above it all that one of the reasons you're seeing, and this is not something President Biden is doing, you've seen it, uh, the same thing, any concerns that a, a US administration has had about the state of democracy and liberalism in India taking, being taken up in private. You saw this with President Obama, uh, President Trump, and then President Biden. And it is partly because for uh, the US, India is now considered strategically important, economically important, and even in a values-based sense, as a democracy that can show the democracy and development, I didn't say liberal democracy, democracy and development aren't mutually exclusive, mm -hmm. that it is important. And as the competition, and that India A is important in its own right because of all the reasons we talked about, it's growing heft, but as the competition, which US competition with China intensifies, you've seen something that actually started in the Bush administration and has continued to, uh, uh, to this day, which is the US seeing India as a geopolitical counterbalance, an economic alternative, and a democratic contrast to China. And that has taken uh, precedence over any values concerns. Mm. Um, and so you've seen, it should not be shocking to anybody in this room uh, that Washington chooses strategic imperatives about uh, over values. The Middle East is a prime example of this, right? If you look at some of um, the US's closest partners. Now, I don't think India, should, I think India should aim higher uh, than to be Saudi Arabia, for instance, or have a relationship like the U.S.-Saudi relationship with the U.S. But nonetheless, uh, that is absolutely, there's a values imperative. I think there's a third dimension, uh, which is there is a question of how effective it would be. So the U.S. criticizes India. Uh, now, I'm not saying, this is, this is the, the conversation that folks have. So you criticize India. <coughs> we stand for our principles, this is what is important but it has no effect. In fact, it might even be counterproductive in the sense that it reduces the potential influence you might have. Mm. And then finally, I think President Biden, more so than others, feels this, is that today, and you've heard Indian officials turn around. Now, you could argue the US should still speak out, but it, there is a sense that, particularly given the state of our democracy here over the last few years, you know, how do you go and tell people around the world the fact that every Indian can go and vote, can, every, can we say that every uh, American citizen who wants to go and vote can get equal rights to vote? So now you can disagree with it. You can say the US should still speak out, et cetera. But this is the logic behind these three or four reasons why you don't see administrations uh, speaking out uh, publicly. Mm. I'll just add there that there is some uh, discordance in US foreign policy there where on the one hand, uh, some of the rhetoric we hear from President Biden of aligning democracies against autocracies and hosting democracy summits and then fist bumping uh, MBS in Saudi Arabia. Um, it's sort of, uh, you know, India within that spectrum has, has just become a country that raises these kinds of questions that, that we're discussing. So for one, I wouldn't compare, you know, I hear this where people will say India is not a democracy anymore. India is not Saudi Arabia. Yeah, uh, and I think you know we should we should be very clear that that is not the case, but I will say you know you do you 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 have this kind of um, uh, I have very strong feelings about why this, there should not be a summit for democracy or of democracy, um, but I do think you've seen even President Biden for reasons not to do necessarily with India has started saying less this democracy versus autocracy framing and moved to saying democracies need to show that they can deliver. And standing next to Prime Minister Modi, he said that again, mm. that we democracies need to, show, uh, uh, need to show that we can deliver. And he also made the point, two other points. One, he said, the, the fact that we are democracies makes us more attractive partners. Mm. And that was, that is as close as get, you get to a signal. That partly you don't want an India that is riven with internal dissension. Or for example, here, if we were fighting amongst ourselves, we will be less effective abroad economically, a country that is actually driving in the same direction or pulling in the same direction is going to do, is going to be more effective. Mm. And then finally, he did say, for instance, he said when he was asked, because at the same press conference he was asked, will you walk back and kind of essentially your statement on Xi Jinping being a dis dictator? And he said no, that he wouldn't do that. But he said, the reason I think that US-China relations are where they are and US-India relations are, are in a very different place is because uh, India is a democracy. So that's as close as you get to a president saying, we're investing in you in part 
because democracy is a special source and source in the relationship. Mm. I want to get to US China and where India fits within that. Sadan, did you want to jump in on this as well before? Well, I guess I mean just very very quickly in, in two lines. I think this is and you know from a, from a US policy perspective, this may be one of those questions to which there are no good answers. Yeah. Um, I completely um, buy Tanvi's point that um, maybe it would be counterproductive to sort of you know stand next to Modi and sort of t and say that well you know here are the five things that we think you could be doing a lot better on. I agree, they would probably get a lot of people's backs up and you know, more people would get upset and start blaming Soros or whatever. Um, so I, 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 I get that. They have um, done that actually. They have, yeah. precisely. Um, so, um, however, that doesn't necessarily mean that the current approach, right. softly, softly, I'll whisper in your ear, is gonna work either. Right. And so we have to be aware that we could be in a situation where we really don't, from a policy perspective, have uh, very good options on this particular set of issues. We may still have very good options on other sets of issues, including economic cooperation, military cooperation, and so on. But in terms of the values debate, uh, I'm not very optimistic. Mm. Um, so uh, US-China, there's been, and I don't want to see it too wonky here, but there's been a lot that's been written over the last few weeks about how you know, if one assumes that the U.S.-China relationship uh, or U.S.-China competition is one of the defining forces behind the world order and geopolitics over the next 20, 30 years, um, where does India fit into that? And um, there are arguments have been made by Ashley Tellis at Carnegie, whom you both know very well, of course, um, that, you know, were the United States and, in, and China to ever um, reach the stage of a conflict, um, India wouldn't really sort of be a partner uh, to America there. Um, but maybe the expectation isn't that it would need to be. Um, what's your sense of, as I think for much of the rest of the world, as they look at this relationship between the world's two biggest economies with such anxiety, um, as the rhetoric on both sides gets worse and worse, um, where does India fit into that place? And I imagine for India, some of it is an opportunity. Um, some of it is also, um, uh, could be quite risky. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think anybody who follows the relationship would, uh, would doubt uh, the point that Ashley made in that foreign affairs essay that let's say tomorrow that there's a military confrontation between the US and China over Taiwan, uh, you can be pretty certain that you know, the Indian, Indian Navy ships will not be steaming towards the Taiwan Straits to <laughs> lend a hand. Um, but I don't think anyone expected that. Um, the, the value of India as a potential counterweight does not lie in, its, uh, in the likelihood of its becoming Japan. Uh, it lies in the fact that here's a country with 1.4 billion people which has tens of thousands of troops in a face-off in the Himalayas with China. It's a contested land boundary. They had the two countries have not been able to come to an agreement on this over, 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 over several decades. And the fact that you know, India you know, is now the fifth largest economy in the world and so on. So you just, as, as long as India uh, is not actively aiding China, and as long as India is broadly speaking closer to us on the China set of issues, even if it's diverged from us quite dramatically on the Russia set of issues. That seems to be the sort of realistic assessment. And I think that's a fair assessment given, you know, given how heightened our concerns are about China at this moment. Hmm. Tanvi, I want to ask you about how much India could be a harbinger of foreign policy in the global south. So when other countries, you know, Indonesia, Nigeria, when they look at the way in which India has positioned itself over the last few years, the way in which it seems to have been able to get a lot of what it wants to get, cheaper oil, and yet friendship with America. Um, can other countries follow what India is doing, other countries in the global south? In other words, is India's swinginess going to catch on, or is the swinginess dependent mostly on its size and its clout? I think it's a mix. I do want to just make a point about the oil issue. Um, the Biden administration, for instance, does not object to 
India buying oil anymore. Mm. In fact, and you might, those of you who are on the energy and geopolitics panel yesterday would have heard this, the, the U.S. doesn't want all the Russian oil to go off the market. So as long as India now is buying below the price cap, Treasury Secretary Jan Janet Yellen said this, please buy it because yeah. it'll keep all our uh, you know, the prices at the pump here as well uh, relatively stable. So that's not even become kind of an issue. I think on the broader issue, yes, it absolutely matters that India has um, size. It has uh, heft in the kind of the, the, the second part or the first part of what Sadhanand said, which is it matters on, on a lot of these dimensions. Geography matters. If you happen to be, you know, if the Indo-Pacific or Asia is going to be the theater and you are a, uh, you know, swing state in uh, or non-aligned, the new non-aligned, and I'll come to that. If you are among the new non-aligned, most Southeast Asian countries would probably fit in that uh, in basket. Uh, you're going to have, you're going to get more attention. You're going to be able to pay, play one off against the other. Um, but it depends on how agile you are, because. In an ideal world, and this is what India did in the previous Cold War in, between the US and Soviet, played one off against the other, derived benefits. But we, you get into trouble if you're not agile enough and you get crushed between the two. Mm. So it's really about the agility, but it also depends on how important you are to both countries. So you know, to, for the, the, the US and China. I don't think India is going to be amongst those new non-aligned and therefore not representative of the global south when it comes to US-China competition. Uh, because India has its own problems with China. Mm. India isn't just going to not take China's side. This is not for the US. India is in an active confrontation, had 20 soldiers killed, killed PLA soldiers on their part three years ago, almost to this week. This is not a country that is kind of wishy-washy. It has its own uh, de-risking set of initiatives, decoupling in certain cases. It goes back to your swinginess point. And India that decides it's not going to allow Huawei and ZTE into its matters to the sea. So it's not going to be representative of the global south now. I think when it comes to US Russia, when it comes to say, saying, look, there are the impact of the Russian invasion of U Ukraine and the war that's followed on food, fuel, fertilizer security, on that, it is representative. Uh, on saying that, look, hey, West, you can't just turn to us as the global south when you know, suddenly you wake up and decide our, our voice matters and you need us to do something and forget us about us get, sending us vaccines during mm. COVID. Because India has that voice, it is, it is using it. And it's using this partly in competition with China, right? Because China is saying we are a voice, the voice of the global south. So India is basically making the point to the US and others, look, if it's either India or China engaging uh, with the kind of global south, you'd rather have us doing it. Hmm. And you see this in these organizations like BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, where I think India will be a voice, not the voice as some in India might like. The government doesn't, they say a voice. But I think its representativeness uh, will be limited uh, at some point. There are, where India is also represented, it's a sovereignty hawk. Mm. Like most new, kind of especially decolonized countries, who doesn't like external powers telling it what to do. So I think on sanctions, unilateral sanctions, on these sovereignty issues, it is representative of the global south. But I think when it comes to US-China competition, it won't be representative. And if the Chinese come marching down the Himalayas again, the global south's not going to be standing by India. They will do what they've done in the Russia-Ukraine right. case, say, don't look at us. Your problem. Please, immediate cessation of possibilities. I mean, Ravi, I've got sort of slightly shorter and um, um, slightly, di di Thanks, slight dis slight, <laughs> slight, slight disagreement there. I don't think it's, it's representative for the simple reason that there are hardly any countries that are in this position. I mean, look at even a large country like Pakistan with 250 million people. It would love to. Like Imran Khan goes on TV every day and says, I wish we could buy cheap Russian oil. Yeah. Um, so this particular set of choices that India has been able to carve out for itself are, in fact, extremely. I mean, you could think of maybe a handful of other countries, maybe Turkey, maybe Indonesia. I'm not saying it's unique, mm. but it is, there are very, very few countries that are, that are in a position to carve out uh, the amount of space that India has been able to carve out. Got it. The Pakistan is buying cheap Russian oil now. Yeah, but it's not able to sort of, I mean, that's their, their I mean, it's obviously not buying anything close to what India is. Mm. And they're also sort of suffering because their relationship with the US has not been able to maintain. Um, I think it's time to take some questions from you in the audience. Whoa, lots of hands. Okay, good. Excellent. Um, let's take a few at a time. I'm going to, 
take uh, questions from the left side first. So let's do my left, that is. Uh, we'll do a tranche of questions and try to answer them together. And then we'll do a tranche of questions from the right. How about that? So um, let's start there, sir, at the back. And I'm just going to ask you to Other please questions. keep questions short and questions. ending with a question mark, if you can. <laughs> Thank you for a great panel. Could your uh, guest talk about the quad okay. and why and how that's significant? Thank you. Sure. Quad. OK. And you're both taking notes. Excellent. Uh, right there. And then to his you, left. Uh, excuse me. Is it on? Yes. Go for it. Uh, India used to be known as one of the most liberal, from a religious freedom standpoint, one of the most tolerant of states. Uh, what do you think the current status is? And question number two, I'm sorry, there was a decision made a long time ago after your independence to use Russian uh, defense uh, to buy MiGs uh, rather than uh, F-4s. Uh, and what's the consequences of that now? Mm, excellent. And if you can pass the mic to your left, please, yes. Thank you again, excellent panel. <clears throat> Maybe a question is to what you said before. Uh, many people, are, or it's been re re recently talked about it, if you look at US-China relations over the past couple decades, People may say, how could that be a model for U.S.-India relationship going forward? If you look at there's a piece of component, the political, obviously, but as well as the corporate economic, where obviously a lot of U.S. corporates invested in China, even though we had icy relations. How, if you look at the U.S.-India model going forward in the next couple of decades, how could you see that that model either being similar to China, U.S.-China, or different? All right, excellent. That's a great set of questions. Um, you have both been taking notes. Sadanand, you've been nominated to answer um, the More question. so he can get more time, otherwise yeah. I'll hear about this for the next two weeks. <laughs> so there was Quad, uh, religious freedom, uh, Russian arms, uh, and then India-US as a model for the future. So why don't I just take one of them and leave the left rest to Tanvi. I want to talk about the liberal religious freedom and the current status because that's sort of... Uh, that's the one I'm most interested in, and the Quad tends to put me to sleep, and Tanvi is the world's leading expert on the Quad. <laughs> so, on the, so I think it's a, it's a really interesting question, right? Because uh, undoubtedly, if you sort of look at the, you know, the dominant media narrative, one of the, most, the things that has changed most dramatically about how the world perceives India over the last 10 years um, is this idea that it's a country that went from being uh, very uh, broadly welcoming to all religious faiths, being one where religious freedom is uh, is under threat. Um, I'd say that there's the, the 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 picture as I see it is a little bit complicated, right? And what happens is that on both sides of this debate, you basically have people staking out extreme positions, and the people who are sympathetic, for example, to the Modi government. They sort of point to, for example, a Pew poll that came out a few years ago that says that the vast majority of Indian Muslims are, feel that they are able to uh, practice their religion without any problem, right? And they point out the fact that India's uh, constitution, constitutionally India is secular, constitutionally India does not discriminate among faiths. And there's, there's, there's truth to both, to, to, to both of these uh, statements. And the Prime Minister himself, when he was in Washington, again said that when that uh, the government's welfare programs, right, things like uh, cooking gas for people and so on, um, those are not demarcated on religious lines. Those go to people of all faiths. Again, that's accurate. Um, the other side of the sort of this, this debate, people who are sort of concerned, point to a couple of things. Um, the first and the most important, and we haven't, we haven't talked about this, but the first and the most important is that they're kind of battling ideas in, in India right now about India's past and what it means to the present. And if I had to summarize it very quickly, there are sort of broadly two ideas. Um, there's the idea of India that was put forward by Gandhi and Nehru, which basically goes to the point that we are all, going back 100 years, um, we are all Indians regardless of faith. It doesn't matter. You may happen to be Muslim or, or, or Christian or Sikh or whatever. And uh, we're all united in this quest to throw out the British who are a foreign occupying colonial power. That was a very powerful idea, and that was the dominant idea in Indian politics until roughly 10 years ago. There was a second idea which led to the birth of Pakistan, which was that actually, you know, Hindus and Muslims were not all the same people. 
We have where we are, we are different in every Indian village. There are two civilizations, and that and those the, the two people cannot live together. We want a separate country for Muslims. That ended up being Pakistan. And for the longest time, these are the two sort of ideas of uh, of, of of the Indian past that mattered. But there was always a third idea that was kind of submerged and has now become dominant, and that's the idea of Hindu nationalism. And what that says when it looks back on history, it kind of agrees with the Muslim nationalism position, except that it is hostile to that position. So they view Indian history as, as India is essentially a Hindu land. These are essentially a Hindu people. There's a particular suspicion towards people who come from Islam and Christianity, because from this point of view, Islam and Christianity are viewed as proselytizing religions with a very different idea of what, the, of, of, of what, what it means to commune with God. And Hindu nationalism then views Muslims and Christians in a dramatically different way because, and this goes back to the founder of Hindu, Hindu nationalism, this guy called Savarkar, and he made a point very clearly in his writings where he said that the only people who are truly Indian are people who follow Indic religions, and those are the religions that were born on Indian soil. And he specifically pointed to Muslims and Christians and said that, well, you know, the Muslims, they, go to, they, they look towards Mecca, and the Christians, they look toward Rome or Jerusalem, and that kind of makes them sort of like a fifth column. Um, he did not say that they should have no rights, but it's definitely a different way of looking at your own citizens. Are you looking at them as all, you're all the same and you just happen to have a different faith profile, or are you looking at your own people in this different way? Hmm. Now from that, so, so what you have is in India in 1947 where you have the first idea which is dominant, which is that you're all, we're all, you, know, you all have the same, uh, same rights, and you, that's still dominant if you look at India's laws and you look at India's constitution and so on. But on the edges, that has come under pressure. So for example, in 2019, the Modi government passed a citizenship law, which was about fast-track fast -track naturalization for Hindus and Sikhs from the neighboring countries. I'll, I'll, I'll hurry up. Uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and, and Bangladesh. And that law had a list of people who were allowed fast-track naturalization. It allowed members of all faiths except Islam. Now, on the one hand, you can say that's pretty reasonable because, well, you know, Pakistan was created on the basis of Islam. There's no persecuted Sunnis in Pakistan. Why, you know, you're, 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 you're trying to show humanity towards people who are being persecuted for their religion. But on the other hand, from a constitutional perspective, uh, it's very problematic because what you're doing is you're singling out a particular faith out of which, which, which you know, one-eighth of your own people happen to follow, and you're making a very clear statement that, you know, these, we don't want these guys. And so there, are more, there were more subtle and I think constitutional ways to achieve this, but it's those kinds of things. Similarly, BJP governments in various state laws, they've passed what they call love jihad laws, which are basically targeting this, it's a lurid, absurd conspiracy theory, which again, a lot of people happen to believe in, that there's some kind of uh, widespread plot whereby Muslim <coughs> men want to lure Hindu women into marriage for nefarious purposes, right? So if it just happens, you know, it's, it's not like a Muslim guy falls in love with a Hindu woman and they get married. It's just like, this, this must be some part of a plot. Um, people have, the, so states have passed laws against this. Clearly this goes against freedom of religion in my view. Uh, a lot of laws on cow slaughter have been really sort of, some of the positions have been strengthened very dramatically. And again, this comes down to, some of this pre-exists the rise of the BJP, but a lot of it comes down to a, to a, to a Hindu nationalist worldview, which is that because the cow is sacred to Hindus, and Hindus are 80% of the population, then how dare anybody else uh, eat a hamburger? So, um, so that's where the sort of the tension lies. So if I had to quickly summar up, I would, uh, sum summarize, I would say that um, yes, uh, there's still a lot going for India in terms of its baseline religious pluralism. But at the same time, there, there are certainly stresses and tensions that are sort of embodied both in legislation and in practice on the ground that come from this upsurge in an ideology that fundamentally looks upon non-Hindu Indians as outsiders. <laughs>
Um, we are almost out of time. Uh, do you want to very quickly riff on uh, the quad? Uh, yes, I, I will try to do this act because uh, the questions were asked. I'm going to try to do this lightning round. Yes. Uh, lightning Russian round weapons equipment. The, um, still, India is still dependent for a significant portion of its frontline military equipment on Russian supplies. Partly, what explains India's position. And the U.S. understands because the U.S. is interested in India's military being ready for any contingency at the China border. So it's been more. There's an understanding in Washington this is going to be a generational effort. Having said that, even prior to the Russian invasion, India has been diversifying away uh, from to kind of other suppliers: U.S., France, Israel, Sweden, South Korea, others. Um, part of it is this is now available to India. It wasn't in the 60s when the MiGs were the only things on offer. So you are seeing a, a, a change. Um, on the question of the Quad, uh, the Quad in some ways is reflective of two different, uh, two different uh, aspects. One specific to Asia, which is you're seeing in Asia, you never quite had an Asian NATO. Uh, they tried one with something called CETO, Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, never worked. Um, and so you saw that hub and spokes model with the US at the center and then bilateral alliances. What you're now seeing in uh, Asia as a whole uh, is a think from, in, from hub and spoke to a spider, spider web, which is not just a center in the nodes, but networks, uh, the, the administra this administration calls it the lattice work, where you're seeing the nodes connect with each other, you're seeing different kind of uh, configurations. And so that is one reflective, the quad is reflective of that. It's also reflective of something even more global, which is issue-based coalitions uh, or interest-based coalitions. So you're seeing these in Europe when it comes to you know, uh, uh, chip manufacturing, for example. The US, Japan, uh, Netherlands are the three countries you need to make a decisive. Who are the swing, who would be swing states? Or swingy. Swingy. Um, in, in Asia, uh, and the, the metric people use is, I use, talk about it as the three R's. Who are the countries on this particular issue set or interest that are uh, resourceful, so have the capabilities that are relevant, that their decisions will matter, and finally, that are ready, that are actually like-minded. In Asia, these four countries, uh, and this is not an alliance, so it's something between a regular partnership and an alliance, it's a coalition. These are the four countries that are coming together, and they're coming together because they share a vision of the Indo-Pacific. They want a rules-based order to prevail. They agree, they're like-minded that the biggest challenges are being posed by rising China's assertive behavior. And they want to do three things, shape a favorable balance of power in the region, offer high quality alternatives in the region, and build resilience in the region. So that's the quad encapsulated. Very quickly, US, China, uh, US, India. I think the, you know, there are some similarities where you're seeing uh, people see India at scale, you know, offer that, uh, uh, that kind of alternative. You're seeing it as a, a company's already seeing it as, if not a replacement, a part of the China plus one strategies. Uh, let me just say a little bit about the differences, perhaps. I think, for one, you're actually seeing already a US-India relationship that is far more societal. It's not just government to government uh, than the US-China relationship was. Uh, you know, the AI panel that's going on, you have like two Indian Americans on it. That's that kind of societal link, the government link that did, just didn't exist in the US-China case. Second, very services dominated too. It's going to be not just manufacturing, it's already very services dominated. Another similarity is yes, you still have an India that's at debate with itself on the level of openness. You have a government that yes, does like national champions, uh, is going to, you know, the question is are they gonna put the thumb on the scale for them, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So there's still a debate in India on the level of openness in terms of you know, whether it comes to strategic, economic, or political issues. But the differences, I think, the biggest difference to me that it is a societal relationship, which is why you saw the administration last week, and I'll end on this point, really talk about this visit uh, and making the choice to have the state visit uh, as about building a shared future together, which is not just government to government, it's business to business, it's technology to technology, startups engaging with each other. And then finally, that you know, not just the students link, but the people to people link, which is really an eco about the ecosystems and not just uh, on, a, on a policy level. I think that's a good note to end on. Um, I'm sorry, folks on the right, I couldn't come to you, but a round of applause um, for our panelists.